My career is kind of amazing because as a performer, I've been doing it 60 years, and as a dialect coach, 40 years. So makes a hundred years in the business. No wonder I'm so tired. I've always been interested in voices and dialects, and uh, as an actor, I've you know, done a wide, wide range of different dialects. And then uh, in recent years, I've, uh, you know, shared that with other actors. I've coached lots of stars into Oscars and Emmys and Golden Globes and Cannes Film Festival Awards. Uh, some of my more interesting assignments, uh, I taught Ben Kingsley to be a New York gangster, which was amazing because he had just done the Gandhi film where he had won the Oscar. Such a saint-like performance. And so I'm coaching him to be this really tough New York gangster. And he's getting the dialogue pretty good, but he's looking at me with his saintly eyes. Oh, we are, we are loving everyone. Yeah, it's all, it's all peace and love. And so I said, well, you know, with all due deference, sir, I had a little bit of uh, prescience there because he had not yet been knighted, although obviously I knew that he would be knighted. I said, when you look at me with the saintly eyes, I find it kind of hard to believe the dialogue. So I said, why don't you just imagine that you're talking to somebody that's 300 yards in back of me. It'll give you the cold eyes. When you got to whack somebody, it's nothing personal. You got that, it's just business. And so he got an Oscar nomination for Best Supporting. And I coached uh, Al Pacino for uh, Scarface. He hadn't done anything like that before. You, you, you don't want to mess with me, man. I Tony Montana. I'm a political refugee from Cuba, man. You and your little Frank Jar cockroaches. And then I coached Gregory Peck when he had done something totally different from anything he had done before. He had to play this very nasty Nazi in The Boys from Brazil. You have betrayed me. You have betrayed the Führer. You have betrayed the entire Aryan race. So I get a lot of enjoyment out of doing all these different kinds of voices. And uh, I was working in England uh, doing different voices on a radio series called Blood on the Prairie with an actor named Don Mason. Well, then Don and I went to see the Andersons. When we were talking about Sting Ray, the Andersons showed Don and me the puppets. And so I recognized that, you know, X20 looked like Claude Rains. I didn't have a Claude Rains voice. Had I had a Claude Rains voice, I might have done a Claude Rains voice. And I discussed with him, maybe, maybe I could do that Peter Lorre type voice. And they said, yeah, that would, that would work great even though it looked like Claude Rains, and they kind of liked that. I guess they didn't want to get sued by either Peter Lorre or Claude Rains. Before I went to England in 1961, I had worked on a film called Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea with Peter Lorre, and I had played a character called Sparks, who was the radio operator. And one time they went to roll a take, and Peter Lorre had gone to the men's room, and the AD didn't notice. So we were doing the take without him. Walter Pigeon did his line, and... Uh, Everybody, you know, did their line, and uh, came time for his line, he wasn't there. So I flipped it in. Uh, oh, well, see, the, the Van Allen belt that hangs up there in the troposphere at that altitude. And so Peter Laurie came back, and I said, Okay, Mr. Laurie, we won't need you for the rest of the day. He said, no, no, I have, a, I have a whole lot of important scenes to do today, a lot of big scenes. They said, No, no, no. Uh, Mr. Easton will do your voice. He said, you do my voice? And I was kind of embarrassed. He said, do that for me. So I did it, and he said, that's very good. He said, a lot of people, when they go to do my voice, they put the finger on their nose. So I don't walk around with my finger on my nose. So when I met the Andersons and talked to them about Stingray, we discussed the voice for X20, and I did the Peter Lorre voice for them. They said, oh, that's it. I said, okay, that's good, yeah. I'll do it like that. And then for the other character, Phones, I used the voice that I had used in that same film. I had been the radio operator from the South called Sparks. So I just did the similar voice when I did Phones, and I would do, all right, Troy, approaching target, 500 yards, 400 yards, 300 yards, five torpedoes. And so he was a southern boy, and very polite, and very helpful, very deferential at all times to Troy, 
he was very honest and uh, very capable, and in many ways almost the antithesis of X20, where X20 was devious and guilty of a lot of duplicity and trickery. So uh, it was kind of interesting because I'd run back and forth. Oh, mighty titan, stingray is doomed. Draw? I think we're getting close now. I think we're about 800 yards away. And so it was a lot of fun to go back and forth between those two voices. And then I did a lot of other miscellaneous voices on it as well. I played an Arab, an Arab oil, oil dealer. And I played a Scott. I, I can't, I can't even remember all the different characters I did, but it's, it's a lot of fun. It was wonderful working with all the people on the show. Don Mason was an amazing person. He was very well read, extremely articulate, and obviously had a very, very high IQ. And I'd worked with him on the War Lover at uh, Shepperton and Bobbington Airdrome and all those places. I'd worked with him for the wonderful Charles Chilton on Blood on the Prairie. It's a series about the history of the American West. So he and I had great rapport. And then Lois Maxwell, who was uh, doing the 007 series, she was wonderful to work with. And uh, then uh, Ray Barrett, the, uh, the wonderful Australian actor. And uh, then David Graham uh, did, you know, odd voices here and there. But it was a very, very good cast. And uh, Sylvia Anderson herself uh, did some of the voice work on it. We would do three episodes at a time. Don and I would get on the train in London and we would uh, go out to Slough in a beautiful, beautiful downtown Slough there, the trading estate. And uh, we would do three of them. And uh, then we'd have a meal and then uh, take the train back to London. What I particularly enjoyed about the way that they worked was very much like radio. I'd been in American radio since 1945. It was very much like that because we would get the scripts, we'd sit around the table and read them, and then we would uh, stand up and do them just like a radio show. We didn't have to worry about matching anything. Sometimes when you do animation work, the animation is done and then you have to lip sync it after. In this case, with their particular uh, super marionation technique that they had, the little characters had a little thing in their throat that was synchronized to match the pre-recorded soundtrack. So we could do very natural line readings. We could interrupt ourselves. We could stutter and stammer and kefaffle around and keep the readings very spontaneous. And then the uh, little figures would uh, exactly match with the lips what we were doing. And then, like all of their characters, the heads were excessively large and the bodies were tiny. That was very interesting to me because children when they make drawings, they draw people with big, enormous heads and tiny, tiny bodies because a child knows instinctively that people live in their face. That kind of gave me an idea that X20 had the big head and uh, that he had an enormous ego, but that he had a strange relationship with Titan because he was scared of Titan and he toadied up to Titan. They had kind of uh, like in the old days since the German army. The generals would kick the you-know-what out of the colonels, and the colonels would do that with the majors, and the majors with the captains. So I figured out that X20 was very subservient to Titan. Oh, mighty Titan! But then that he was annoyed with Titan, and then he had his own ego, and when he was doing his own thing, that then uh, he was the king. And then he was very devious and very manipulative, and uh, as all people who are toadies to dictators always have to be. My memories of the Andersons are rather ambivalent. Very, very creative people. But uh, to use an old American phrase in my childhood, the American nickel or five cent coin had a buffalo on it. And if somebody was a little on the thrifty side, we used to say, oh, he squeezes the nickel until the buffalo hollers. So let me say that the Andersons were not compulsively generous. What was very, very interesting for me was to go and see the puppets and a lot of the technical work being done. And those people were really geniuses. Years later, I worked with Derek Maddings on a series of films called Die Unendliche Geschichte in Germany, The Never-Ending Story. So I worked on 
the never-ending story, the never-ending, never-ending story, and the never-ending, never-ending, never-ending story. And uh, so Derek and I would talk about the old days on Stingray. And so technologically, they were way ahead of their time. I was uh, very pleased to be part of the Stingray process because I understand that it was the first series uh, to be done in England that was done entirely in color. And that brought back memories. I had done the very first color television show that CBS had ever done. It was experimental. It was an episode of a series called Life with Father. I'm very glad that I did Stingray. I'm very pleased that it's become something that is so much the part of generations of little British kiddies growing up and seeing it, and then their children and their grandchildren seeing it, generation after generation. I'm glad that there's these loyal, devoted fans that like the show, and after all of these years, that it's still a cult favourite.